So this is part two of the high-powered circuit board design in KiCad 5. And in this video, I'm going to go over the actual circuit board layout and uh, the exporting of the Gerber files. So like last time, I will uh, jump into a time lapse of me going through and building it. And I'll commentate over it and try to explain the main points and the main things that I do. So to begin, we start with the schematic and go over the ERC checker to make sure that there's no errors in the layout, which there weren't. And then the next thing is to go through the uh, CV PCB to make sure that we uh, label and connect all of the footprints we have to the parts on the schematic. And for pretty much all of my components, I make sure they are uh, parts that I built for the footprint itself, just because I don't really trust any of the other footprints um, from public libraries. So after that, we uh, save the net list as we did before. You have to save it before and after you assign the footprints to the components. After that, we are ready to work on uh, the layout itself. So for this board, uh, or first you have to uh, read the current net list and that imports all the footprints that we just synced together. But for this board, uh, the size constraints were pretty specific. So what I like to do is make the uh, layout of the board, the dimensions and the mounting holes in SolidWorks. I'll save that as a DXF and then I import it into KiCad as a uh, edge cut. So I don't have to worry about the layout of that. And then the next step with any uh, circuit board layout, and really the most important part, is going through and selecting where all the components will go. Um, and that really is the biggest, most important thing to do. Um, if you do a good layout and choose where all the components go, that's really the hardest part of most layouts. Um, and I also went and made a ground pour uh, on the bottom layer, on the top layer. And I typically do that when I start out just because it limits the amount of rat's nest um, air wires that there are. And here just going through again and moving all the components. And I like to do that in blocks. It makes it a little bit easier to visualize where everything's going. And there was just uh, shrinking the solder, solder paste uh, clearance mask. So you need to shrink it to whatever your fab house specs are. And same with here, I'm going through the global design rules and setting it to what the fab house I use can, um, can manage to do. And I usually give it a little bit extra just because if they can go down to like four mils, which is what my house can do, um, I typically keep it at uh, 8 mils just because there's no need to push it to that point. So when I start doing uh, more of the layout, I like to break out another uh, SolidWorks uh, DXF file with quadrant layers and layer lines, and that just helps uh, put the parts at a more symmetrical location. Because again, I, I go overboard to make sure I place everything properly at the start because it really makes it easier later on. And when I start doing the traces, I always like to start with the power traces first just because it's kind of the more important, especially on a high current board like this. Once you get the power traces run, everything else tends to be a lot easier. And I typically, with any of my power runs, I start kind of haphazardly with the thickest trace I can do and get everything laid out properly. And then at the end, I'll come back and make them copper pours. I tend to use with any high current application, a pour over a trace, because you can usually get a lot more uh, width than you can with a trace. And here, this is a trick I use with pretty much any high current application you basically simulate a bus bar within the board itself. And this board was made on a two ounce or is made on a two ounce copper board. Um, 
So what I do is I do a nice wide trace where all the main power comes from and I stitch it together with vias. I put them on the solder pad for the power input. I removed that later just because it would make it hard to solder. But what I do is I stitch vias on the top and bottom. So I make essentially a two layer bus bar that is on the board itself. So it essentially doubles your current carrying capacity in the same layout of that board without having to have an external bus bar. Obviously on a two layer board, which this is, it does make routing the traces a little bit difficult, but there wasn't a lot to run for this. So it, it didn't really matter. So now just running the main power from the bus bar to all of the fuses, which go to the FETs. And again, I just use traces, we'll add pours later. And then the next step is to work on more power running. This is for the five volt uh, regulator. And I'll point out later, uh, I actually had the footprint of this with the pins flip flopped. You always need to make sure after you finish your layout, I always print it out and test measuring and looking at data sheets that all the components fit. So I flipped that later on. And then I work on placing the components for the temperature sensor. And again, I do it in blocks. This isn't where I'm gonna place the final components, but I just put them uh, in a section together. And when I like the layout of that, then I'll move it to the final place. Doesn't really matter if you lay it out at the start where it's gonna be, just where all the components will be in relationship in that block. Um, and then here are all the FET drivers and just, just like I've been doing this whole time, I lay them out in blocks and then we'll move them to their finer, final places afterwards. Uh, and with these, it's really important to get those capacitors as close as you can to the power inputs just so they have enough power for that inrush of current. Um, they can draw it from the capacitor and not the main uh, rail of your power supply. And here, just running the five volt to the ribbon connector, which goes to the LCD screen. Uh, really the easiest place was just to go out behind it. It's a longer run, but it's a plenty wide enough trace for that. I think it was 25 mils, which is more than you need. And here with the FET drivers, again, just moving it really as close as I can to, again, uh, be able to supply that inrush of current and use the widest traces you can for any of the power runs. Um, if you have the room really with any layout, you wanna use the widest traces you can. Uh, it's never gonna hurt you using them um, as long as you have enough, uh, enough space. And with that, what I did, I noticed a lot of people, uh, it seems like they don't understand with Netlist, you can annotate from either side. So what I did here is I noticed that the pins I was using on my schematic didn't line up to the proper layout on my board. So what I did is went to the schematic, flipped, flip flopped the orientation and what pins they used so I could use my layout without having to uh, jump any uh, traces with any vias. So that's something always you want to keep in mind. You can go back to the schematic and make adjustments on the fly. And for running the traces from the FET drivers to the FETs, I started out doing this in a really stupid way with vias going over every power trace, uh, which is just a way excess use of vias. Even though nowadays you really don't get charged for the amount of vias from most fab houses, it's still not a proper design uh, technique. So I didn't realize that there was a much better option after I finished that. So I realized it here. I go back and delete all those. And then what I did is just using a single via for each trace, I ran the 12 volt supply on the bottom layer and then put the trace to the FET on the top layer, which avoided needing a separate via for each trace. So it cut it down by like 20 vias, which again, I tend to try to avoid um, excess vias whenever I can. Uh, just because it's kind of an old school technique. You always wanna use as few as you possibly can. Um, and then from this point, I like to, or I wanted to put the debug pins in, and these, nothing special, it's just to debug and program the uh, LCD board. 
And then, like I said, I had the main block for the temperature sensor. And here I moved it kind of close to where the FETs are because that's where most of the heat will be. Didn't really have to be exact since it's gonna measure the enclosure temperature more so, but I just moved it in an area that was somewhat close. And here, again, no, nothing really tricky here. Um, just running all the I2C lines. And then again, with this capacitor, uh, decoupling capacitor, you want it to be as close to the input pin as it can be. Uh, just so it can draw the current from that and not having to go from your main power trace and to decrease um, the amount of noise on the input voltage. And then after this, I put on the second ground layer, the ground pour, just because it helps avoid warping on the board and it helps lower the impedance of your power supply. And then I ran a DRC check and I realized I picked the wrong library component with uh, then the actual temperature sensor I used. So I'm glad I found that. But again, I always print out the board and double check all my measurements to make sure I don't do anything stupid like that. So I switched out to the proper uh, footprint, redid where all of the resistors and everything are and the traces, and then uh, redid the DRC and it passed it. Um, and then I add just a couple random uh, stitching vias just to make sure my ground planes fill properly. Um, and after that's done, then like I said, I add uh, to my power traces, I make them copper pours just because you can get a lot more current carrying capacity in a similar amount of area by using a uh, pour instead of a trace. That's something I use in pretty much most boards that have any type of uh, significant current draw over maybe 500 milliamps or an amp, just because you really can get a lot more width of your trace if you use that pour. And I don't show it here, but I did one on the top and bottom, so then it stitched them together on both layers. And here just added some more arbitrary number of vias. Typically with stitching vias, the more you use, you're gonna lower that impedance, um, but there's really no science that I use. I just add where I can. And now I'm finalizing the layout of the FETs. Uh, I move the diodes closer to the output and here just arbitrarily running traces because again, I add the pores later on, um, just making sure it covers up the area so the DRC will pass. Um, and the diodes, it's better for them to be closer to the output. So if there is an inductive spike, it gets it uh, significantly before it gets to the uh, FET itself. And here again, just adding stitching vias from the top to bottom, from the top and bottom layer. And again, it just lowers the impedance of your power plane. So when I was going over this in editing, I noticed that I forgot to record when I finished up the last couple things in the layout. Uh, so what I'll do is just kind of go over those changes with the main one being what I was saying, how I replaced the majority of the power traces going to the FETs with copper pores. So all of these, I did a separate pour from the top of the fuse to the, uh, the simulated bus bar. And I could have made it a part of the pour itself. Um, I, there's really no reason I didn't. Either way, it works. And I also took the output from the FET with a copper pour to each of the output uh, connector. And I put the other end of the fuse to the connector in each of those. With these, it also helps, like I was saying, with the, uh, the thickness, because you can get a little bit extra space, because uh, you can fit it more around the connectors. But also with these, if you have that big uh, trace right here, It'll cir the circular part will get close to the other trace and it has to cut it out in a weird way. So it also just looks a little bit cleaner using the copper pores. Um, the other things that I changed is like I said, uh, let me put my silk screen on. 
I changed the orientation of the 5 volt regulator because um, the pins were swapped, like I said. I added a silk screen to everything and then I moved the um, edge cut holes to hole layouts that had the callouts for the arrangement for the screws that I was using. Um, I think three and a half millimeters. Uh, so that pretty much wraps up the second part of the video. If you've made it this far, I appreciate watch that you watched it. And if you have any questions or anything, just let me know in the comments. Or if you have any suggestions on how I should do future videos. Or if you have any uh, suggestions on topics for future videos, I would love to hear that. Thank you.